Commodores are burning hot. No, they're not, Dave. They're, they're, they're actually just uncool. All this and more coming up on This Week in Retro. High resolution color graphics. This land of high technology. The revolution in technology that made the information age possible. Those kids are not afraid of computers. Arcade done justice. The C64 is not cool. 3D defeated and paint wins. All this and more coming up on this week's show. Up to date news for out of date tech. Welcome back, Chris. How are you? (laughs) Hey, how's it going? Yeah, not too bad. Uh, it seems ages since I was last on here, but not too long ago since I last saw you, Dave. Yeah, we um we met in a pub in Glasgow for an all too short pint. Um, I would have loved to spend more time there. I was just getting warmed up. Um, that was good fun. It was very yeah. Good that fun. was good. Uh, you will, I presume, at some point, be back in Glasgow. At some point, yeah, I'm sure I will, because it's a lovely part of the world. My brother lives there as well, and he took me on a lovely trip up to um, Loch Rannoch, a hotel overlooking the loch. Loved loch it. Rannoch. Absolutely love, love, love Scotland and and scotch. I learned a lot about whiskey and scotch and peated whiskies that night. <laughs> so, <laughs> yes, I've gone down a dangerous new rabbit hole, Dave. <laughs> and it's good how to see long Stuart there as well. Oh, how long? Go on. Yeah, we had Generation Pixel. We saw him as well. How long yeah. were you away for? Two months. Yep, so I was in two the UK months. for two months. Yeah, um, so basically just visiting a family because I've still got my siblings over there, of course, and, and some lifelong friends as well. Um, but I think I think the standouts for me this time were, were visiting, let's call them new friends or online friends because obviously I went to Kickstart, which was great. Mm-hmm. I went to um, the RMC Cave towards the end of my stay there as well. Yeah. Um, and I went to Arcade Archive as well. And so just – Wheels. And, and Wales, yep, and, and well, in fact, even my wife met up with one of the YouTubers that she follows because she does craft and stuff. So it was just really good to people like yourself, Dave and Stuart, Generation Pixel, obviously Neil again. Um, so if I try and name all the names, I won't be able to do it and I'll forget some. And so just everybody mm. I met, everybody I shook hands with, took selfies with, uh, it was so amazing to actually meet these people face to face. The wife didn't know what was going on at kickstart because people were coming up to me asking for selfies and asking me to sign stuff and she's like how <laughs> how did they all know you like she had no idea and i had no idea this was going to happen either it was like i don't expect any of this so it was just so much fun so thank you to everybody that said hi and if you just gave me a wave or a thumbs up i just had such a blast in yeah every part of the uk and even sweden that i went to yeah good fun good fun yeah I, i've seen you you've got a recent video that you record, I think, an hour after you got off the plane? <laughs> About that. Well, two and a half hours after I got off the plane, um, yeah. Some pickups, obviously, I've got a, a lot of the stuff that we collect is more available in the UK because that's where I grew yeah. up. So those are the items I have in the nostalgia store. So, of course, I'm going to make good. But um, a bit of a sad – I'll share a sad one on here now. Um, I got a boxed – Oh, Trojan yes. light phaser for the Amiga, complete with the discs. Um, however, airport security at Heathrow didn't like me um, trying to go through with something resembling a gun. Who'd have thought? So they actually took the phaser away. They did give me the option to check it in, I must say, um, but I, I opted to have it destroyed because it would have meant you don't go backwards. Once you're in the airport flow, you don't go backwards. And I'm sorry, it wasn't worth the hassle and the possibility of missing my flight to go back and try and check just the gun in. And I was a bit worried about what would happen happen to it um, through check-in baggage as well. So I do have the box and discs. I need a working white Amiga <laughs> um, Trojan Life Hazer. Stupid thing is, I looked up what I bought this for. I got a bargain because I did forget. 25 quid I paid for this box, Dave. 25 quid. Mm-hmm. So that's not bad at all. Meanwhile, somebody on eBay is currently trying to sell just the gun untested and thinks the Amiga version is the ST version, um, and they want 30 quid for just the gun. So we'll see what happens. Watch this space. Um, but, yeah, I got that. Also got a uh, kickstart, Sessanoid off Hoffman. Sessanoid. Sessanoid. I called it Sessanoid in my video, didn't I? I've asked, Se- I've asked Hoffman what the correct pronunciation is, and he doesn't and he know. Says- he doesn't know. It's Sessanoid now. You heard it here first. And and if we both say it, Dave, let's both say Sessanoid at the same time. One, two, One, three. two, three, Sessanoid. Sessanoid. Oh, Sessanoid. You, you said it wrong. It's important that we Is both right? say it because then you get it in stereo. Sessanoid. Sessanoid, um, yes. 
he did he did also wrote on the inside he signed it for me dave and he wrote this is just for you he wrote also available in stereo so there you go because i know you love amiga split stereo so that that's great i've um, got my bsmx now Oh, fantastic. You can ruin your Amiga sound. Now, the other thing, (laughs) I must thank Mike (laughs) Daly and also Pajaco, who is a frequent contributor to the stories on This Week in Retro. Pajaco supplied me with a mint copy of Lemmings at Kickstart, and so I really want to take another opportunity. I've thanked him a million times but for for gifting this to me, and, of course, Mike Daly for signing it in the top corner there. So, yeah, fantastic. So many standout moments in my trip like those. Hello, Mike, and hello, Paul. (laughs) <laughs> um, I think we better get on with it. Um, I think we should. Yeah, before we talk too long about that. But it, it is it is fantastic to see you back on the show again. Thank you. It's been a long time since we covered a Kickstarter. In fact, it feels like we covered lots of them when you, you and I were fresh-faced newbies on this show, but not so much recently. However, there's been a new Kickstarter, and the response to it has been absolutely phenomenal. It was funded within a day after launch and the funding goal wasn't even that small. It was a big goal. And as I'm writing my notes on Sunday evening, it was already £10,000 above the target of £25,000. That's a huge amount in already. And as far as I know, this is the first time one of the biggest names in UK retro YouTube has put pen to paper for a book. It's a collaboration between this YouTuber and Matt Precious of Numskull Design. It's his third successfully funded Kickstarter, and this one is going to blow the success of the other two out of the water. Uh, Now, Numskull make game and movie tie-in collectible stuff, like the ducks that I really don't like, to be honest. But the other stuff looks good. The quarter-scale arcade machines, um, clothing, there's lamps, all sorts of other stuff. So clearly, they know what they're doing here. And of course, I've kept you waiting to hear who it is that's writing the book, who the YouTuber is. And of course, the story title was The Clue. It is, of course, Kim Justice. And the chatter about this book is so intense that I expect you probably already know about it anyway. Now, Kim has been on YouTube for years, 12 years, in fact. That's right back to a period before Retro started to take off again. And it's in a period where there was not very much money involved in it. Uh, it wasn't the, there was there was far fewer people making content and it, it was much much more amateur years before Neil got into it and before I made the leap from being a casual retro fan into filling my house with it and Chris you were a similar journey uh, as well um, casual interest and then all of a sudden nope this is it full on so 12 years ago Kim was making videos she is famous for making extremely in-depth and long documentary style videos on YouTube. She's done loads of them and I've enjoyed every single one that I've watched. She does tend to focus on Spectrum and Amiga uh, most often uh, and never has a good word to say about the poor old Atari ST. Um, She also streams on Twitch and you'll often find her going through the huge catalogue of Amiga games trying to play everything. But lately she's been doing arcade game deep dives. She's been covering the complete catalogues of Konami, Sega, Data East, Namco, and I'm looking forward to when she inevitably covers my favourite Capcom. Um, They make my favourite arcade games. So this book is a coffee coffee table style book, A4 size, with lots of new photography of the games and cabinets by Matt and the text by Kim, as far as I understand. And knowing Kim's work, what we're not going to get is just a lazy run through of quick what can be quickly and easily grabbed from Moby Games and Wikipedia on each game. Kim always does her homework. She knows fantastic depth on the stuff she covers, and that's why her documentaries are good compared to some of the snash that you get on YouTube. Um, I backed it right away. It's £30 for the early bird hardback. At the time of writing my notes, half of the early birds are gone. So I'm not sure if there'll be any left when it comes to broadcast this on Saturday, but the price goes up to £40, which is still, I think, all right, considering it's an A4-sized book. It's called Arcade Decades 80s Edition, 
which tells me that there's going to be a 90s edition, given how successful this is, and it has 100 of the most important games from the 80s in it. Chris, have you backed it yet? Are you going to back it? It's going to have lots of pictures, and I know that that's what you like in a book, lots of pictures. <laughs> you know me, I don't, I don't back anything. <laughs> I haven't backed it yet. Um, I do like books or magazines that have pictures in them. Uh, read into that what you like. Um, and I do like arcades, so maybe this is actually right up my alley. Um, but when I think of Kim, Kim Justice, the interesting thing is when I first got into Retro, 2018 was the sort of break point for me when it was suddenly like, oh, I need everything from my past again. And I went into one of the retro shops in, in Perth, the first one I ever stepped into. And the first person I started chatting to, which was about Amiga stuff, instantly said, do you watch Kim Justice on YouTube? You have to watch Kim Justice. So even all the way over here in Australia, instant recognition and instant global name for sure so um yep and i think as you've explained there the fact that you know she goes into doing her own research rather than just paraphrasing wikipedia is maybe what sets her apart and gives her a a good following i didn't realize it had been 12 years which is quite interesting because one of the videos i just caught up with on youtube only today was clint lgr um Mm. discussing that he's been doing it for 15 years um so that's how early kim has been in this space is you know almost as long as as lgr which is you know right up there so yeah i hope this kickstarter goes very well yeah sounds good the arcade was my first love of video games i i played games on the arcade before i had something at home so this is right up my alley um there is talk of stretch goals in the kickstarter but no mention what they are yet i'd imagine that kim is probably blown away with the success of the kickstarter so far um i know that stretch goals are sometimes used to push people to back it to make sure it gets over the target um but i don't know what the stretch goals are maybe there'll be more arcade things covered than around the 100 is intended but whatever it is i'm still going to be happy with this for 30 quid um link in the show notes if you'd like to back it we are sponsored this week thank you very much by pixel addict magazine pixel addict magazine come out how many weeks between issues um it's every few weeks every few weeks yeah and they have a new issue for you every few weeks currently we're on issue 22 which is the loggables issue there's an interview with uh sean cleaver about the evercade um which is a a fantastic success story about how to wed modern technology with old style of play uh, among lots of other different things in there uh, you can get pixel addict from their website chris which is pixel.addict.media did you hear what happened when we had bob from retro rgb when we asked him what the, what the url was what did that he really say it was he's like oh, I, don't, I don't know what it is <laughs> that's the whole point <laughs> yeah it was very good anyway um thank you very much for sponsoring us go and subscribe as a pdf or get it posted through your letterbox nothing quite the same as having the thump of a magazine landing on your doorstep dave important question for you is the c64 cool if you like brown colors yes um <laughs> Nah, it's cool. It's got it's got Sid. Sid sounds fantastic, and it's got some amazing games. Yeah, well, it's actually it's actually not cool. Um, the C sixty four is simply not cool. Uh, at least not always. Uh, and this heartbreaking news to millions of people um, comes to us from a story shared by Indigo Prime on the subreddit. They linked us to a very detailed article by Sven of Sven's tech site, which details the reasons why the C64 isn't cool and what you can do about it. Sven is, of course, not referring to how desirable the C64 is or was, but issues with thermals, especially on original chips that are becoming harder to replace, Um, FPGA solutions aside, of course. It's a very detailed and technical article in which Sven goes into depth about his methods for measuring the temperatures of the VIC-2, SID, the CIAs, even the ROM and RAM chips uh, and various iterations of the C64, and even tests voltage regulators and states the ambient temperatures for each test as well. That's how detailed it is. 
His reason for doing so, as he states, is that reducing a chip's operating temperature by 10 degrees C can potentially almost double its lifespan. Uh, he then discusses his findings and solutions uh, that he tests, uh, including various heat sink options, um, pitting them against the original RF shields to see how they stack up. Uh, but this led me to think, Dave, um, the topic of adding heat sinks and fans to old systems that never needed them in the past does actually come up on the interweb quite a lot from time to time. Um, have you added cooling solutions to any of your original machines? I have added huge, big Zalman heat sinks to my graphics cards from around the year 2000 in my old PCs. These are supposedly passive heat sinks. They're great big massive things that end up on both sides of the card, take up half the case. But all I've done is I've put those on and then I've hot glued an 80 millimeter fan to either side of those with the logic being these old graphics cards struggle under heat. The BGA soldering, that's the ball grid array soldering, was a fairly new thing then, and it seems to be springing loose on some of them. So the idea is I don't want temperature cycles as much as possible. It's not just about the heat. So I've put it on those. I've obviously changed the fans in lots of things, like my Mega STE power supply. I've changed the fan for a Noctua fan there. Um, other things have changed the fans in. But it's funny that you mentioned the, the C64 in this because... Um, I've got a project to do. It's a 60 clone from Rob Taylor. This lovely red board here is a is a, a, a recreation of the C64 board. Nice. Um, it's a uh, like-for-like recreation, but on better quality. And um, I have all the components for it in that, that crate there. I have to get around to it at some point. But a long time ago, I bought these as well, which are aluminium heat sinks. Oh, Okay. Um, so I've got lots of these. Uh, there's fins on top of them of various different sizes. And I bought them for the C64 because I'm concerned that the, the custom chips on it uh, made by Moss, uh, the custom chips on it are, are, are susceptible to dying. And, and I'm not sure if we have – I'm not entirely convinced by the 10 degrees double lifespan thing. I'm not sure how scientific that is. I would say that it might be much, much more than that or much less. I mean, I think if you're running a chip very hot all the time versus running a chip cool, it's not just double. It could be a, it could be a, a tiny fraction of life. On the other hand, if you're running a chip at 30 degrees and you bring that down to 25, is it really going to make a difference? I, I don't really know. Um, but I, I don't want to have it. I don't want to build it and then have it, um, have it die on me. I'm also thinking about, how much space is there in the bread bin? And when I do build it, the bread bin's the, been the name for the the case, the that that particular style of C sixty four case. I'm sure you know that, Chris. Uh, yeah, but yeah, when I one. when I build it, I'm going to see if there is space to put a tiny little fan into. It's trivial to find a five volt power supply in within there to to to, to work the fan, and it won't it won't take any load off the power supply either that is going to cause any problems. So if there's space in there to get even just a little bit of airflow, when I've built my home NAS network attached storage things, so boxes with lots of drives in them, I found that hard drives can get very, very hot. But unlike processors, even just the tiniest amount of airflow at all drops them down by 25 degrees at times just a tiny amount because they're not producing much heat. But the way they are, they just gather and build up the heat. And that's what these old ceramic um, the ceramic ICs will be doing. They'll be generating a tiny amount of heat, but keeping it in there. So a heat sink with thermal, thermal glue and even maybe just a little bit of, of airflow will make a massive difference. I mean, eventually, all these chips will die if they're kept in use, but there could be hundreds of years of life in them. Um, but maybe not. Uh, the custom chips are definitely worth saving. But it did make me think, though, about a huge change in attitude from me back in the day to now. Back then, I didn't give a stuff about longevity. 
give me the next thing. I don't care what this looks like when I'm finished finish, finish owning it. I didn't look after things properly. Um, but now, when I get a machine sorted, I want to have it that way forever. I'm always thinking about, this is me putting this machine together, and that's the way it's going to be forever. I've, I've just rebuilt my Mr. Multisystem, for example, and um, it's now got a one terabyte micro SD card. It's got the slice underneath with the, the, the joystick ports and all the rest of it. And that's it. I don't think I'll ever open that again. I don't think I want to open that again. I want it to be that. Now it's a monolith. It's perfect the way it is, and that's the way I want it to be forever, and I want that to last 30 or 40 years. Um, so it wasn't that way back in the 80s and 90s. Back in the 80s and 90s, we didn't really care. We didn't think we'd own things for that long. But now, of course, we're looking at owning things for a long time. Mm, that's fair enough. This would be an interesting read for you, actually, knowing that you're building a, a, a let's call it a new C- C64, um, because he does actually go into things like fans um, and the possibility for interference and how to mitigate that as well. Um, and also, the, his reason for steering away from fans is because part of the charm of the C64 is the fact that it's silent. It is, you know, it's from the period and it doesn't have. But I don't silent, think, right? mm. well, exactly. I don't think there's an issue. Question on <laughs> thermal paste, Dave. I've got to ask you this. Mm-hmm. How much? How much thermal paste? How much thermal uh, paste? Come on. Because no YouTuber I, um, will ever show you how much because they know they'll get destroyed by all the content. So I, I used to I used to take the spreader and put a really thin layer on. Mm. And lately I've either been putting a big cross on or a pea-sized dot in the middle. But I would direct people to go to Gamers Nexus to where Steve proved that it doesn't matter as long as you get the right force on the heatsink. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Um, yeah, uh, as for fans, I mean, I, I've built a lot of PCs. I've never really mentioned this on this, but I've built a lot of modern PCs. And for fans, my huge big tip for fans is you can run a 12-volt fan at either 5 volts or 7 volts, easily and you can buy adapters on ebay for a couple of quid and a 12 volt fan running at either 5 volts or 7 volts depending on the fan will run inaudibly you can't hear it so you can have fans that are running without making any sound and if you've got them doing that you really it it it, there's huge diminishing gains with fans so if you've got the fan spinning it comfortably then it's going to do 80% of the work that it would do if it was spinning a lot faster, diminishing gains from it. So even just the tiniest amount of airflow, like what I was talking about with hard disks, might be enough for a C64. So I'm going to say I disagree with him saying uh, that you don't need fans for the noise and all the rest of it. If you can get a fan in there and you can run it and nobody knows, you can't tell a fan's running and it's not causing interference, then it's, it's perfect in my view. Yeah. Well, like I say, he does provide good tips. It's just not his Mm. personal choice. So it's not that he's anti them. Um, Mm. Yeah. So that's cool. For me, you know, even though the summer in Australia will burn your eyes out, I've not actually added extra cooling to any of my old machines. Um, And the whole idea of adding heat sinks to chips that never had them, in my mind... It kind of reminds me of Roo Shoes, so <laughs> I'll explain Roo Shoes. You need to, because I don't know what you mean. <laughs> for anybody outside of Australia. So when you're driving a car in Australia, uh, I know in the UK, deer have become a bit of an issue. Um, well, kangaroos uh, have, have been an issue for a long time and will continue to be an issue for drivers throughout the country. Uh, and so one of the things you can do to try and protect your, your pride and joy, your car, is you install these things called Roo Shoes. Now, what they are, they're they're tiny. I wish I had one to show you, but I don't. Um, but they're tiny little plastic like funnels that you stick. They come with double sided sticky tape on them, and you stick them somewhere on your front bumper. And the idea is that they will emit a high pitched whistle that, regardless of the speed, Dave, you or I cannot hear. It, it sounds like snake oil, I know, and that's probably because it probably is. But um, the idea is that this high pitched noise emitted by the roo shoes will scare off any potential and incredibly stupid kangaroo they are the dumbest animal you, you will ever come across <laughs> um, um it, it will scare them off so they won't jump in front of your car but here's the thing here's the thing and this is why it's relevant to what we're talking about here they cost pittance the, the price point of these fantastic devices that will save your car and your life without a doubt cost next to nothing so 
I've installed them. I haven't got any right now on the cars I have right now. But in the past, I have actually installed them because it's like they were like $3.50 or something insane. So you go, well, what if it does work? I might as well install it. So why I think this is relevant to the discussion about especially heat sinks, they don't cost a fortune. So no. if they do anything to help um, you know, uh, the longevity of these devices that we now you know, prize, um, then why not? You know, seriously, why not just fit them um, in the hope that they do something um, rather than nothing? I don't think there's a problem with that. But I think Sven has got some very compelling arguments as to why they actually do more than than Roos shoes do. <laughs> I was going to say, that I'm not sure if the analogy works if if I don't believe that Roos shoes do anything. Excuse the noise. The, <laughs> the, the, the cat the dot is attacking the microphone. <laughs> My point is, though, even if you're in the least bit sort of, well, the chips never needed them back in the past, so why do they need them now? Oh, It uh, doesn't come. It doesn't cost much, well, so you might as well, you know. It's, it's de- the answer to that is dead easy. Yeah. Back in the day, there was a one-year warranty on it, if yeah, you're true. lucky, and you yeah. bought it, and you didn't think you'd have it in five years' time, whereas now, mm. if you've got a C64, you think, I want this for 30 years. Yeah, no, that's so fair that, enough. That, that's that's the difference. I mean, my fix at the Roo moment... shoes. Roo shoes. You're all going to go and install Roo shoes. I wonder if they work on, I could become a millionaire, Dave. I'm going to sell deer shoes. That, it doesn't quite work. I need, I need a better name. Deer, deer steer. No, deer, I'll come up with a name. It'll be the same device, but for deers in the UK. This is, oh, yeah, brilliant. Anyway, what do I do for my machines? I haven't fitted any extra fans or heat sinks, I must confess. Um, but it does sort of, you know, um, yeah, I do, it's something I think about occasionally. Is it? Is Are they all going to burst into flames next time I turn them on? What I do do is if it's really cooking and the temperatures can get up in uh, over here, I, I simply don't turn them on. Um, so if the ambient temperature is really hot, I simply don't turn them on and, and I instead punish my modern equipment like my modern um, PC and my PS4 and just listen to the aircraft-like noises the fans make um, to keep those going. Is it not just five or six degrees difference of ambient temperature? Is it not like usually 21 degrees where you are and then in the summer it's going to be up to 26, 27? It can't be what, that much of a difference. What are you talking about? Inside, what? I mean, inside your house. Oh, inside, well, if your air con is, is good, um, yeah. then, yeah, so the outside temperature will be getting up to, let's say, 35, 40 degrees quite regularly in the, in the first summer. Yeah, and then so inside... We have in this house, for example, evaporative air conditioning, which is fantastic if it's dry. And if you've got the airflow correct, you have to have a window open for the airflow to come through. So it can get hot in this house. And I'm not the only one that has either evaporative air conditioning or can you believe no air conditioning? There are still houses over here Mm. with no air conditioning. They're nutters. Um, So, yeah, what I do is if I can feel that I'm sweaty, I'm not going to make my my collectibles sweaty as well yeah. um that's probably the best way to put it uh but anyway i i like the detail that sven's gone to he justifies his findings nicely rather than leaving up to speculation or making you think it's snake oil like rushu's um and his solutions are not just to throw fans or sinks on everything he actually details which chips to target and why so it really is worth a read um i hope he covers more systems so because at the moment this one is for the c64 when you take off the, the, the RF shielding on a Atari ST or an Amiga, there's lots of chips that might benefit from it if they get hot enough. I've actually got a, a temperature gun. Mm. I've got a, a, a temperature gun. What's, what's the, what, would you, what would you call them? A ther- uh, it shows oh. me a, a, thermal, a thermal camera. That's it. A thermal, thermal imaging camera. camera. Oh, yeah, okay. so that, that, yeah, I bought that with, with that in mind, seeing what's hot and dealing with it. You mm. can use it to identify faulty chips as well if they're hot so if you've got a a spectrum you turn it on it's not working you use the thermal imaging camera and you see that one of the ram chips is glowing hot well guess yeah. what change that ram chip uh, yeah so that helps as well cool. I, how, I how many kangaroos do you deal with on a daily basis do you see kangaroos all the time um no no if you go on a golf course you'll see quite a few and they'll always appear when you don't want to see them basically <laughs> so yeah if you go looking for them you won't find a single one <laughs> so if you've got family coming over and visiting they go let's see some kangaroos in the world you go sure let's go drive my car down a, and a dusk is the best time uh, and you won't find a single one but when you're on your way somewhere and you're in a rush that's when you'll find one on your bonnet 
And do they read your bins and stuff? No, they don't read bins. No, no, no. not at all. So they're, 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 they're very bin much chickens. like deer then. Yeah, they're just like deer. Yeah, yeah. Bin chickens. I, bin chickens. I, um, I, I had a thermal imaging camera as well, actually. I was using it to see what's hot and what's not. They kicked me out of the shopping centre. <sighs> Let's have some housekeeping. The big news is you're going to have to do without this week in retro for a week. The Duncan has run out of batteries. He needs a week off. He deserves a week off, I think. Um, And I'm going to happily take the break as well. So there will be no show next week. We'll be back the week after. And there will be one more week in October without a show and, of course, our usual two-week Christmas break. But other than that, we expect to be there every week. In the time when we're not here, maybe try a podcast you've never listened to before, and I'd recommend ERG Presents. They've just done their 300th show, and they're absolutely incredible. They are they, they pick a, a new machine every week, They'll come back to old machines as well and do two games on it week after week. Um, they've been doing this for five years. Absolutely incredible. Um, I'd like to welcome our newest patron, William. So thank you very much for signing up, William. I don't think there's any more housekeeping this week. Move on to briefs. And from Spud by Night, links the Micro Men drama and ask the question, is Micro Men the best film drama about the early days of the computer industry? Now, I think so. And in the comments, a few people brought up Halt and Catch Fire. And I watched that for two or three episodes and turned it off and thought it was absolute trash. I thought it was just rubbish. Um, It was loosely based on things and then dramatized beyond any any, um, sense I thought it was rubbish, so I turned it off. Um, there are, was it Pirates of Silicon Valley, is that what it's called? Uh, it's, it's quite good as well, but Micro Men, I think, is the best I've seen. Any opinions, Chris? Uh, I think Micro, uh, Micro Men is fantastic, absolutely loved. Obviously, some of it's dramatised, and, and yeah. but then it leads you down a rabbit hole of listening to people like Chris Curry talk about yeah. which bits were dramatised, and you learn more of the true story. It's fantastic. I think, I think that the, the Micro Men, what happens in Micro Men is mm. is possibly true from what everyone says there's no one yeah. there's nothing that everyone that everybody argue everybody says is not really true in it mm. um broadly speaking the only other one i would put up there is the one about atari putting the all the games in landfill that's quite a good one as well all right actually yeah. right back to early atari that's, that. that's, yeah. that's good good watching as well i can't think what it's called um is it called game over i think it might be called game over somebody will tell tell us uh, next story from Jacko Vintage uh, BBC Computer, found at Derbyshire Tip, rehomed in a museum. Uh, this is a nice little story about someone saving a micro from the tip where usually you're not allowed. So, yeah. From Christ of Why Do You, someone has connected 444 game consoles to one TV for a Guinness record. So, I mean, the cabling must be incredibly complicated and difficult. But when you need to use a spreadsheet to keep track of it all, maybe it's going a bit too far. Maybe he's better off with a mister. Doug of Capulet, Capulet sure, um, has taken the IBM logo, the I, B and M, and crocheted it for her husband's computer. It's actually really well done, and it sits on top of a proper IBM 300 PL. So I think it's a crocheted I, as in the I you look through, a bumblebee, and an M, and that sits on top of the computer. <laughs> that's that's pretty cool. From Pajaco, it turns out there's a need for speed game for the Japanese domestic market, which only has Nissans in it. Um, and there are <laughs> loads more, including someone playing Doom Resurrection 3.1 and a 32X. That's something we mentioned recently. Uh, Serena, which is a 32-bit operating system for the Amiga. Um, fans making GTA 3 playable on the Dreamcast and MS-DOS emulator iDOS 3 returning to Apple 
iOS, and loads more stories. Go to our subreddit if you want to see what's there. Um, if you're on a break from work and you want to kill some time, then having a browse in the subreddit is a good place to go. Lots of things to do. Comment on and submit your own articles to it. The URL for it is Chris. Um, Reddit media slash us. <laughs> yeah, close enough. Reddit.com slash r slash this week in retro. <laughs> It's not often that people have good things to say about Microsoft. They got the blame, I think unfairly, for CrowdStrike. And this week, they have supposedly blocked the workaround for Windows 11 without TPM, Trusted Trusted Platform Management. So supposedly, you won't be able to install Windows 11 without that little module or the Um, newest generation of chips. I'm sure there'll be a workaround for it. Uh, But I've noticed a huge difference between Windows across the years, between Windows 95 and Windows 11. Windows 95 was the first Microsoft operating system that was aimed squarely at consumers, at home users, at people playing games and using the internet and just writing letters and emails instead of at business users our home office users. So Windows 95 is the first one where it really felt as if it was at the general population. And back then, we paid for Windows 95. We didn't pay a small amount, and Microsoft made money from what we paid for it. And you can tell that when you go back and install Windows. I always go for Windows 98 Second Edition, Windows 98 SE, because it's very compatible with DOS stuff. And it allows the largest drive sizes. In fact, I've not come across a reason to go earlier than 98 SE. Um, Windows 95 was great, but it took to Windows 98 and then, then SE for them to hammer out so lots of bugs, which was an enormous endeavor as they were trying to trying to bring all this, this varied hardware under Windows and make it all work and make Windows present it to software in a way that software could be quite agnostic about the hardware you had installed. The biggest the biggest example of that is, of course, is DirectX in Windows. DirectX was the answer to what was happening with DOS games where you had to have drivers for various different 3D cards, which were uh, expanding in, pos- in in popularity with DirectX, you didn't. You had you, you interfaced with DirectX, and it interfaced with the cards. So they, they did a lot with Windows ninety five through Windows ninety eight, and when you install it, it's really trying to tell you what they've done for us, all the changes they've made, all the new features they've added. I, I like it. It makes me feel like a, a valued customer. It's it's a positive, forward looking thing. But if we go back to the future, well, the the present. Um, I felt that maybe from Windows 7 onwards and certainly by Windows 10 and 11, I'm more of an employee doing what Microsoft tell me. No, I won't get to choose when updates are installed. It's either right now or it's later, whether I like it or not, the system will install them. No, No way to stop it. More things are locked down and they're inserting adverts and paid for software more than ever and telemetry. And when I did some research into how much Windows 11 actually costs OEMs to put on machines, it's really not very much at all. And it turns out that we've gone from the days in Windows 95 of paying for the operating system to now where we are now of it's almost it's almost free and Microsoft have to make money other ways. So they want us to buy their monthly subscription services for Microsoft Office and uh, OneDrive, etc or package up our data for advertisers because we're not paying for the operating system any other way. And over the years, they've cut out various tools and applications and accessories and replaced them. But it's not all bad, though. I mean, I've noticed that Notepad, for example, doesn't delete what I type between reboots. So if it does reboot now, I don't lose what's in a Notepad. And it's got tabs as well. Um, Finally catching up with what Notepad++ have done for years. But today's submission... 
uh, which is from Dr. Local, is that they're killing off 3D paint and keeping the original paint, which dates back to 1985. And you guys seem to like the idea too, as it's our second most upvoted submission this week. So Microsoft introduced Paint 3D as 2017 as part of a creator-focused update to its Windows 10 operating system, representing a modern take on the Microsoft Paint app that dates back to 1985, the inclusion of new 2D and 3D image editing and creation facilities, so features built on the basic functionality of MS Paint by adding much-needed support for layers with a revamped UI, and nobody likes it. As far as I know, nobody likes Paint 3D. I'm sure there'll be exceptions, but I think if you were wanting to use that kind of thing, you'd have GIMP or you'd have Photoshop or something else. And if you didn't, you just wanted Microsoft Paint to make to, to take a picture and put a circle around it to, to show someone. So I'm glad that they've gone back to Paint, not Paint 3D, and Paint 3D's been, been dropped. Um, and I do recognise it's a little bit of a little bit redundant because there's nothing stopping you replacing the apps within Windows with your own ones. In fact, I've recently reinstalled Windows 11 on my main machine, and um, I picked up this this thing Windows 11 D bloat, and it kills off all the telemetry. It makes the start menu seen. It gets rid of all the 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 Candy Crush stuff on it as well. It cuts out so much stuff and it makes the whole experience better. And it shows me, it showed me that Windows 11 can be slick and fast again. Um, but what do you think? What do you think about paint, Chris? And are you going to stick with Windows? Because lots of people that I know are switching across to these new Macs, which seem to be incredibly powerful for what you get, what you pay for. And a few people are even switching to Linux because you don't need Windows as much as you used to. Do you think you'll switch? Well, uh, let's discuss paint first. I've got a real soft spot for paint after, you know, use deluxe paint on the on the Amiga. And when mm. I jumped to PC, you, I discovered that obviously in Windows, you've got MS Paint and it wasn't actually bad and, and felt quite similar to deluxe paint. Took me a, a bit of a time to get used to. Um, and one of the things I did in paint was there was a really nice image in... Um, one issue of Alien vs. Predator, the comic book, and I, I, I copied that, um, and it's probably the only time I've actually done a good job of drawing something by hand in paint, but it was good fun. But So Paint 3D, what's interesting there is I didn't know it had layers, and that Not is... Nice. Yeah. That is the thing missing from paint, right, is layers. You can do so much. I mean, I still use paint today at work. I'll occasionally just want to quickly mark something up. Screw it. I'll just do it in paint, right? Yeah. But without layers, you can really stuff yourself up really quick. Um, so I had no idea. I Because it was called Paint 3D, I just assumed it was all about 3D. Now, I've got an interest in 3D modeling, and I used to do 3D Studio Max and Infinity D before that. Um and I, I think I tried Paint 3D a couple of times and couldn't really work out what it was aiming for and, and never touched it since. So I don't know if it's a case of poor marketing, the, these extra, let's call them actual useful features that, that Paint 3D actually had, because I certainly didn't know about them. Um, yeah, so that's my view on that. I'm, I'm quite glad. Not glad that they're getting rid of Paint 3D, because now I want to try the layers at least, um, but glad that they're keeping MS Paint and not killing that off. Maybe they'll add layers to that. That would be that would be fantastic. That would be the best of both worlds. Yeah, I think it was too much of a change for me. It just didn't didn't feel this. It didn't feel like paint at all. It was like yeah. this this new weird three D modeling thing that I don't have any time for. Yeah, and let's face it, Microsoft know how to do layers. Layers work perfectly well in PowerPoint, for example. Yeah. Um, so they know how yeah. to do layers. Just add that into paint. It's, how hard can it be? With with GIMP existing, I guess that what well, there's not the need. But yeah, I don't know. It's weird. Um, re jumping that's that's quite interesting because, and I've been discussing this with various people on Discord, especially other people that do video editing. Um, I really want to move to Mac, and it's not because I really hate Windows. My current machine actually has said it can't update upgrade to windows 11 and still hasn't so i'm actually it's not that i'm trying to avoid windows 11 because i'm perfectly happy running on windows 10 right now um but i like the idea of the the m chips i like the idea of the lineage um you know that the risk um computing um and 
what I really like about Apple, even though I've, I usually joke and say they bring me out in a rash, but it's that they never seemingly build a bad product, whereas in the Windows PC market, it's always a gamble, especially with laptops, because I'm talking specifically yeah, about yeah, laptops Yeah, I get you. I get you. I get you. People yeah. will produce a product so that they can slap a label on it that says yeah. it'll do this, and when you get it home, it's not quite good enough. And, and whereas the, with Apple, you know you'll get what yeah. you you paid for definitely yeah and, and the big one for me when it comes to to laptops is battery life um and on that's where it's a real gamble i find on on all of the ones that i've touched anyway the windows laptops um so i just need to fund a, an m3 macbook air by selling my porsche um, i think that will give me almost enough money to buy the one with the spec i want i'll still need to do some saving obviously to actually buy a mac um after selling the porsche or or i'll probably just end up buying another pc because the price difference is that massive <laughs> i really want one though i really want an apple I yeah. don't think I want to switch to Apple. I don't think I will. I mean, the, the only the only gripe I've really got with them, I think it's clear that when you're buying an Apple, you're paying for the operating system with mm. the hardware. Mm. You don't do that with Microsoft. You buy an OEM license along with it. It comes and you, you maybe don't know you're buying the OEM license, but it's included there, and it's, it's, it's a small amount of money. Apple still managed to get people to pay a decent amount for their operating system by selling the hardware that the operating system works on. And that's where they get that from. But if you look at the pricing for the the, the, the M-based laptop things that they do, they're very attractively priced until you look at the specifications and find out the yes. base spec is 8 gigabytes. Yes. And and then, but then they'll argue why you only need 8 gig, Dave. You only need 8 well, gig, Dave. You just That's all you need. Oh. If you need more than 8 gig, you're doing it wrong. <laughs> well, why do they sell 16 gigabyte upgrades then? And they charge you an absolute fortune to upgrade to 16, way they more do. than it costs they them, do. and the memory is sold or then. Yes. You yeah. can't buy it. So not only can you not upgrade it yourself, mm. but you can't realistically buy it and then upgrade it later. Imagine there's a way to do it, but it'll cost a fortune yeah. to upgrade it to later. So you're, you're, you're faced with this this FOMO when you buy it saying, well, I don't want to buy something at 8 gigabytes. I've been running 32 gigabytes in Windows for years. Yeah. Why would I drop down to 8? I'll need to get at least 16, and then before you know it, the price has jumped up. And it's then, like here, and yeah. then Dave, you realize you've still only got 256 gig of storage. <laughs> so you still so all. So you, want to up that. That? so you want to up that to the 512, right? <laughs> so you've got to up oh, that. It feels like booking an airline ticket. <laughs> so bad. But I want yeah. one. I'm going to yeah. buy one. You know it's gonna I, I, think, I, I think, though, all things considered, that's just how their pricing model get, get, works and what you get for your money seems to be decent value. Um, mm. I, I, don't, the- I don't think I'll ever switch. I'm not sure. I've got this, this, this virtual pinball table I'm building. Mm. And it's on hold just now while I do some stuff in the house. But once it's built, it'll have a, a, a 4070 Ti Super or a 4080 uh, Super in there, which is a super fast um, graphics card. That could be a gaming PC. If I run an USB cable out the back of it, uh, a display port cable out the back, it could be a gaming PC as well, which then means I'm free from Windows because that's all I need it for. So maybe I could go to, to Linux then. I don't know. Yeah, could do that. Yeah, sounds like a way forward. So from November the 4th, 2024, users can no longer download the Paint 3D app from the Microsoft Store and it will no longer be updated. Presumably, you'll still be able to use it if you have it, though. And I don't have it. I just realized that I, I uninstalled it because I didn't like it. I didn't want to be given the option of Paint 3D. I want Paint and that's it. Um, but maybe the layers thing is good. Maybe I'm going to find out. Maybe lots of people are going to find out now that actually it's quite good. <laughs> so on to the question of the week now i'm just getting us out of contest mode i'm slamming that shut from last week uh, so last week um we asked the question do you remember the first time you saw games being broadcast on tv most likely it was it was a dedicated games or computing show but maybe not what was the show what was the system and what was the game? And did it feel like gaming had become mainstream or was it a bit cringy? So I'll go for the first answer. Top answer from Soggy Fennel 448 For me, it was also on the adventure game on BBC One. 
the adventure game I vaguely remember. I remember um, that, yeah. A classic theme tune with contestants regularly playing games on the BBC Micro as one of its challenges. Anyone else remember it? I vaguely remember it. I've, I, I've, yeah. I need to jump down the, the YouTube rabbit hole of watching some old episodes because I, I, I'll have embellished it in my head. And, uh, and it always had that grid thing at the end. The last challenge yeah. was they had to get across yeah. this grid with an invisible opponent. Yeah. Yeah, and I remember there was the currency game. involved as well. Was it was it was uh, it triangular coins? It was a bit remember. like if you watch Crystal Maze, it's almost like an early version of that. The two feel yeah. very similar yeah. to me. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Krypton Factor as well felt a bit like that. Oh as well. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm. Next answer, Chris. Uh, by Sweaty Peach three two six six. Being old, I think it was a BBC show. It might have been Tomorrow's World, and there was a segment on the BBC Micro being used in schools, specifically Granny's Garden. I have a vague memory of recognising it as it was the game we played at school. After that, probably Amiga games on Games Master. Oh yeah, nice, good spot. Um, Senex says in Portugal. The first thing I remember is Templo dos Jogos, Games Temple, starting in 1995. They introduced new games, did reviews, and provided cheats. I don't remember games being a thing on TV prior to that. It's not uncommon that I stumble on a game that I've never played but recognise from being covered on that show. That's interesting. Um, given the time frame, that's mostly PlayStation, Saturn, Nintendo 64 games, so barely retro by my definition. Well, there's an interesting thing. What's retro there? Um, looking back, it's very 90s with geeky guys and pretty girls presenting. Perhaps the channel execs wanted to capture the attention of male teenagers, but the girls were the better presenters. Oh, moving to Portugal. Fantastic. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, actually, in Portugal, um, you get to go first in Azul. Anyway... Uh, imaginary Swing 8606, I would have to say it would be first class on the BBC. Uh, the quiz show just edged its coolness by having the gaming sections using Hypersports and 720 Degrees, an absolute gem of a programme. Don't remember that one. Uh, first Class, I think, was it Debbie Greenwood that did that one? No, oh, no, I, I that seriously why don't I remember, it. remember that one. Yeah. Um, there's lots more in there. There's Get That's Fresh. Funny. Uh, Game Master mentioned again. Um, Sarah Green on Saturday Superstore. So oh. that's before, I think that would be before the, the, the gaming things. Yeah. Bad Influence. Um, People talking about yeah, the Data Blast. Yeah, yeah. The Micro Live. Um, <laughs> Lots of different answers there. Yeah, um, and there'll be more answers by the time this goes to broadcast, hopefully more from outside the UK, because I'm always interested to hear what it is like for that. Hmm. On to this week's question of the week, though. This week's question of the week, I think we'll ask people about Windows. So I think, I feel that we all ended up on Windows, like it or not. For me, it was like it. But for other people, it wasn't. People who had to give up the Amiga, for example, to go onto Windows as the Amiga really reached the end of its life um, and died. The Amiga did die. It died. What? It's dead. Talk no, it didn't. Just winding up Lord Borak. Um, we all ended I feel as if we all, almost all of us, would have ended up on Windows. And then now it feels as if some of us have left it and lots of us want to leave it. So my question of the week is, are you going to leave Windows? Have you already left Windows? And how does that affect you and your retro life? Thank you very much for coming back on, Chris. Oh, no worries at all. It was a pleasure. Yep. Good Would fun. you like to come back on in a few weeks' time? Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Just let me know Great. when. Yep. I thought I thought I'd ask while we we're recording to make it more difficult for you to say no. <laughs> oh no, not another episode. <laughs> <laughs> It's great to speak to you. It's weird because we did this show for, for, for years, two years I think we did, mm. and I never met you in person. Then yeah. you left and I met you in person. I know. And now, I want, now I, more than anything, I want you back on the and show. And then we got very drunk. Well, I did. You were driving. Um, <laughs> yeah. It was great. It was, it great. was weird. I was, I was drinking was 0% so cool. beers and then driving home, yeah. Yeah, it was so cool <laughs> to meet up. That was fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Really, really uh, but thank you very much for coming back on. Uh, we will see you all in two weeks' time, not next week. We've got Duncan is recharging his batteries in his Borg recharging cell. Um, there's the mug. Um, 
and we'll see you then. And I think it will be Reese back. And I'm not sure who the guest will be. I will make sure we've got a guest, though. But thank you very much for watching and listening. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Bye. He's waving, and I'm waving. We're all and waving. Neil is waving. And some people wave even if they're driving when it comes to this bit in the show. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, Duncan. They're all going to drive into kangaroos if they're waving. Oh, dear. <laughs> This Week in Retro was presented by Neil from RNC The Cave and Dave. It was produced by me, Duncan Styles. The podcast version of the show is available through your favourite podcaster, including Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And the video version is available on the This Week in Retro YouTube channel. Join our community subreddit at r stroke this week in retro to suggest and vote on the stories we cover on the show. If you watch This Week in Retro on YouTube, please give us a like and subscribe to help us reach new viewers. If you enjoy our show and would like to support it, then please check out the link to our Patreon page in the show notes or description. Thank you for listening, and we'll see you next time for more up-to-date news for out-of-date tech.